so we'll switch back to glaucoma. <laughs> um, so they've asked me to uh, talk a little about on how or where to rank laser in the gl in glaucoma treatment, glaucoma management. Um, I am going to reiterate some of the things that you've already heard uh, this morning, or this, this evening, I should say. Um, I think, you know, the glaucoma uh, management has had a traditional stepped approach. Um, uh, I think physicians like a nice, uh, simple approach to management, and they don't, they're not keen to change that <laughs> approach. <laughs> um, so, you know, medications first, of course, then there was laser SLT. We added in sort of MIGs in between there, between incisional surgery. And then finally, there used to be uh, the cyclodestructive, cyclodestructive procedures, which were considered more high-risk uh, procedures. Um, I think that as we've learned today, lasers have really are changing that paradigm. Um, we're going to just really focus on SLT, subcyclodiode, and then uh, thermal diode cyclophotocoagulation. You know, there have been all these new MIGS devices. We've got like uh, a new MIG device coming out every um, year or so, and this has really increased our options for management. Uh, this, you know, this graph here and uh, uh, diagrams is getting more and more complicated every day. So I think our step management has been, uh, looks more like this now and <laughs> with uh, really uh, how do we decide when to use laser and integrate this with all of our MIGS procedures. Uh, these are the relativity stairs by M.C. Escher. But I think that, you know, we need to stick to our sort of uh, treatment principles. I sort of call it the C principle that uh, basically we want to treat these patients to maintain patient's visual acuity, visual function, quality of life, of course, with sustain sustainable cost, uh, use a safe procedure, use an easy or efficacious procedure, and uh, again, uh, the procedure which will be most efficacious at, at bringing the level down to slow optic nerve progression. You know, this is the treatment option guidelines, of course, from the, from the EGS. I've sort of modified it a little bit. I've put SLT here as a primary therapy in there, which I think they had, but I sort of highlighted it. And then after SLT, we've got, again, the micropulse uh, diode or the uh, subliminal diode, CPC, mix procedures, incisional surgery, and thermal uh, CPC. So if we, you know, when we look at this as a graph, um, also from the uh, British Journal of Ophthalmology on whom to treat graph, rate of ganglion cell loss resulting in functional decay is, of course, different in different glaucoma to size. On the horizontal axis is the age of onset. The vertical axis is, of course, normal vision versus blindness. We, of course, would like to avoid patients uh, having severe functional impairment. Um, you know, there's those patients who have relatively slow rates of progression. And then uh, those patients, younger patients, of course, who present early, who have relatively fast rates of progression and can go blind very early. And of course, we have to adjust our aggressiveness and treatment for these uh, various rates. And sometimes, of course, we don't know what that rate of obviously is other than following them. Um, but I think it's important to set a target intraocular pressure. These are slides from the Canadian Ophthalmology Society, which I like. Uh, and I think formulation of the target IOP is re a really important step in our management. Um, they're defining target IOPs, the upper limit of stable range of IOPs, which uh, retard further uh, optic nerve damage. And setting these pressures, uh, setting the target IOP, of course, they stage these patients according to one to four severity, suspect, early, moderate, or advanced glaucoma. Uh, and base again, based again, uh, again, on optic nerve or visual field, patient factors, age, life expectancy, quality of life, uh, patient's own endpoint, and risk, other risk for progression. But again, I think, as it says here, there's a fine line between setting an appropriate goal to prevent optic nerve damage and also being overly aggressive in lowering the pressure. They basically show that staging for each eye for glaucoma, look, again, suspect early, uh, moderate, and advanced glaucoma. Um, and this is their staging, basically suspects usually uh, one or two of the following, IOP greater than 21 with suspicious disc. Early glaucomatous patients, of course, have um, cup to disc ratio usually less than 0.65, mild, mild uh, visual field defect. More moderate glaucomas, again, have more visual field defects and uh, usually uh, more uh, larger cups. And then, of course, your more advanced glaucomas with larger cups and larger visual field defects that may encroach on uh, central fixation or within 10 degrees. 
Their target, uh, they suggest, for the upper limit of initial target pressure for each eye is shown here. Again, um, suspect can be uh, uh, high of 24 millimeters or really try to achieve a 20% drop. But then as we get towards more advanced uh, uh, glaucoma, of course, we'd like to maintain much lower pressures, um, early 20 millimeters, moderate 17, and then uh, advanced glaucoma is 14 millimeters of mercury with at least a 30% drop in pressure. You know, so where are we with all of our laser procedures? Well, as you know, we showed before, SLT is, of course, should be considered as a first-line therapy. Um, and I've sort of put this sort of diagram together looking at, um, you know, there has been a paradigm shift looking at IOP lowering and also risk um, of procedures. Of course, we'd like to avoid those procedures, which are, again, low, li low IOP lowering and high risk. And our goal is, again, high, high IOP lowering and low risk. So we have SLT as primary therapy. We have, again, medications I put in there, uh, somewhere either at the same level or in between. Um, now, cyclodiode is, as um, Dr. Gauss has indicated, and these are non, you know, quote unquote, non-invasive procedures. So I think that they deserve more attention and they're getting more attention, as, as we said, as being treated earlier. So I'm putting them in the range of, uh, sort of below mixed procedures or at the same level as, as a mixed procedure. Mixed procedures are actually obviously invasive. And then as we move up the ladder uh, to more invasive procedures, uh, we have the thermal diode cyclophotocoagulation, uh, which can be, which is again non-invasive. And then finally we have a trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. Again, we expect on average uh, about a 20 to 25 percent reduction uh, with SLT, as I've shown earlier. Then we have the sub-cyclo uh, procedures, of course, which uh, Dr. Gauss has discussed, and these slides are similar, so I was, sort of won't uh, go over too much, uh, uh, reveal them too much, but again, effect on both the ciliary body and uveoscleral pathway, again, fractionating the laser versus the more uh, constant power um, delivery with the thermal cyclophotocoagulation. The real life experiences, and there's not still a lot, a lot of data out on sub, uh, subliminal cyclophotocoagulation, but uh, this is a study by Lyle Newbold from uh, Columbia, again, looking at, uh, I think this was with a 25% uh, duty cycle at six months, about a 29% reduction of intraocular pressure with a 1.6%, uh, with a reduction of medications to 1.6, from 2.9 to 1.6, or reduction of medications in this group. And this is another uh, study from Romania, 52 eyes, 37% um, IOP reduction with an 18.5% average reduction of medications in that group of patients. Nine eyes were retreated, there was no pain, there was no hypotony, and there was no uh, reduction of uh, best corrected visual acuity. So this, again, is with uh, subcyclo, uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, this is from St. Joseph's uh, Hospital, which I, uh, um, I was uh, happy to uh, receive some of this data from Dr. Lashkar. And he basically showed, again, this is at 25%, um, he showed about a 31% reduction of intraocular pressure in this group without any uh, significant complications uh, with subcyclophotocoagulation. So, um, and then there's this discussion, as uh, we, we, uh, Dr. Gauss has indicated, looking at 31.3% uh, versus 25% uh, duty cycle. Um, their study, this study by Lashkar, uh, which I think is probably coming out soon, uh, showed about a 85% um, success rate with 31.3% uh, um, duty cycle versus a 65% with a 25% duty cycle. Um, more inflammation with, slightly more inflammation with the 31.3 percent, but and less with the 25 percent. And their recommendation was, it began to consider on a case-by-case -case basis, but it, I think as you indicated, that most of us are using the 31.3 percent uh, duty cycle at this point. So, you know, the sh again, we have all these new MIGS procedures, and we have MIGS light and MIGS heavy procedures, the light procedures such as the eye stent, uh, Visco 360 or trabeculate, trabeculotome or these Omni360 devices or KDB devices, I think those are giving moderate reductions of intraocular pressure. If you look at the MIG studies, 
uh, you see that uh, there's, it's very small print, but basically there's about a 10, the range is large from 10% to 45% IOP reductions in this group. I think um, most of us who do these procedure would, procedures would probably agree there's probably a 20, maybe 25% uh, reduction of intraocular pressure for most of these sort of MIGS light procedures. So you're looking at, and maybe even less, that so you're looking at similar re IOP reductions to uh, basically selective laser trabeculoplasty. Uh, then there's finally the thermal diode cycle photocoagulation with your standard G probe. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the machine that uh, uh, Quantel uses has uh, both probes, both the subliminal probe and the G probe. Uh, and when you look at the IOP reductions in that group of patients, and these are worth, uh, again, those patients with refractory glaucoma, you're looking at IOP reductions in the range of 21.5% to almost 50 or over 50% reduction in that group of patients. So you get, can get, you know, fairly large and substantial reductions using a, uh, basically your standard thermal cyclophotocoagulation. And, and as Dr. Gauss has indicated, there's... Um, there's studies now showing, and there's a number of studies showing that cyclodiode can be used, uh, even standard cyclophotocoagulation in patients with good vision, and we're actually doing that. We're actually, we use uh, standard cyclophotocoagulation and subliminal in both uh, patients with good vision and um, patients phacic as well. Um, so we, we're not, uh, we're tending to use the uh, subliminal cyclophotocoagulation in patients who are phacic, but um, I actually prefer the, uh, or I'm using the cyclodiode. Uh, I try to restrict that to actually the pseudophagic patients. But this, this um, study also showed that um, uh, they were followed for five years after diode, standard diode cyclophotocoagulation. 67% um, achieved um, or maintained their, retained their vision of 2060 or better. Um, those cases that really lost some uh, visual acuity were mainly due to uh, glaucoma progression or and sort of in macular edema. Um, and the IOP was controlled in about 80%, 79.6% with no cases of hypotony. So their conclusion was most of these eyes with difficult to manage glaucoma retained their visual acuity over long term uh, after using the uh, diode laser cyclophotocoagulation and that their um, Loss of two lines of Snellen was basically similar to that of uh, trabeculectomy or tube surgery. So when do you use it? I think stand, standard thermal diode, we're, we're still primarily using that in these more difficult patients with refractory, refractory glaucoma where other glaucoma treatments have failed. Um, I think you know, that, will, that may change and I think that will change as, uh, as we use more and more a subliminal or a sub -cyclo, cyclo, uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, again, patients who are poor candidates for other type of incisional surgeries, we are using, uh, again, subcyclo or, sub, or standard cyclophotocoagulation. I'd like to bring out a point, and we're going to be putting together a paper on this, that um, we're using cyclophotocoagulation uh, as our sort of primary treatment following glaucoma shunt procedures that aren't doing well. So if you have a patient as a glaucoma shunt and their pressures are rising and they're not controlled any, more, any longer on on standard medications, we found that cyclophotocoagulation works remarkably well in these patients. Um, you can do a limited number of spots, uh, basically 12 to 14 spots with uh, standard cyclophotocoagulation or your standard uh, uh, protocol for subliminal cyclophotocoagulation. And we, we get um, uh, substantial reductions of intraocular pressure because, you know, they have a valve in there. They've got some outflow from the, from the valve. If you're reducing aqueous, in, in, uh, aqueous formation even just a bit, they get a nice reduction of intraocular pressure. So it's my recommendation to actually use that cyclophotocoagulation in that group of patients. And again, I think we could, we're beginning to see that we can use cyclophotocoagulation in patients in eyes with good vision. There may be slightly greater risk for, uh, with thermal cyclophotocoagulation versus the subliminal uh, diode. So I think, again, the benefits are, again, it's a gentler, for subliminal, it's a, a gentle diode cyclophotocoagulation. It's basically shown to be as efficient as thermal, preserves the ciliary body, improves uvascular alpha. It's safe and, of course, can be repeated. And again, allows us for earlier intervention in these uh, patients uh, with moderate to advanced glaucoma and even good vision. 
So conclusion, where to rank laser, uh, glauco laser and glaucoma management, I guess uh, it's use it earlier. It's, I think, safe and effective as an early treatment for glaucoma. Thank you very much.